Um, so we're going to start off today just by talking uh, about the Silk Road. So I have this picture up on screen. Um, take a second to read through the description on the right side. Um, and just I want you to look for things that you that you consider to be notable in it. Um, you know, really important features that you that you noticed. And you can just leave those in the comments. I'll give you like 15 seconds. And just leave this in the comments if you uh, if you come up with some answers. Okay, um, that's fine. I can go over some stuff that I sort of saw myself. Um, this is a great like a caravan um so you have on the center of the picture you have all these camels in a line um and they're sort of they're the core of this merchant merchant group um because they're really the ones who are transporting the goods and then and if you look at the bottom you see all these really cool buildings and these could be interpreted one of two ways um as like city markers or as caravanserai and basically caravanserai you can imagine them as like the ho uh, holiday inn of the silk road um, so basically, you know, you could like stay there for a few nights just while you recuperate. And oftentimes there were marketplaces that were nearby. Um, so, and then lastly, we can sort of see it. This really shows the impact of the Silk Road. Um, cause if you look on the, if you look on the side of the caption, you can see that this guy, he never actually visited the Silk Road in, in Central Asia, but he found it such a significant, uh, development of the world that he decided to put it in his atlas. Okay, um, so just in this stream, there's gonna be a few things we're talking about. Um, I'm gonna begin with an intro. We can do some more sourcing practice. Um, and then we're gonna have this big continuities part portion um, where we talk about the early Silk Roads and the later Silk Roads. Um, then we're gonna talk about cities, technology, and then Q&A. And that Q&A period is basically, it's all about you guys. So if you have a question from class, um, if you wanna talk about a subject that you seem really interested in but your teacher didn't really touch upon, um, if you want you know if you have a question I'm here to help you out and that'll be at the end um okay so this is just a map um, to help you really understand the Silk Road um, so if you look on the side on uh, near like the east you can see that there's China and you can see all these different little dots and all these different trade routes that span from China all the way over to Europe um, so it just helps you to get it helps you to gauge like the massive expanse of this Silk Road covered um, another really important thing to know about the Silk Road is that it feeds into a ton of different networks. Um, so I'm going to take out my mouse. Um, if you look over here by Europe, you can really see that it lights up the Mediterranean. Um, so the Silk Road led to a lot of Mediterranean sea routes. Also, you have that it leads to the Royal Road in India. Um, that's part of it. And it leads a lot to the Indian Ocean trade routes. Um, Indian Ocean trade routes are really important. I think that we have a stream on it that you could watch. Um, that's just very helpful to know. It also leads to sub-Saharan trade. Um, so if you look at, at Northern Africa, you can see that it you know, has this webbing all over. And that's really the sub-Saharan African trade. OK, and now like, let's really just get into it and start off with an easy question. Well, not so easy question. What were the Silk Roads? Um, and you can sort of think of it as a series of roads that link the East and the West in this you know, period of 600 to 1450. Um, and basically they span all the way from China to, yeah, to Africa, to the Mediterranean, um, and sometimes further up North. And it really went through these three major golden ages. And what were those golden ages? Uh, you have the early golden age, which was between the Roman Han, uh, you have the Tang, Byzantines, and the Abbasids, and that was around 600, and that's really the main golden age. Um, and then you have this strange sort of rejuvenation by the Mongols, um, and we'll touch on each of those a bit more. So basically, um, the College Board, <laughs> they love talking about the Silk Roads. I realized last year that almost every year, every other year, they have some sort of essay question about the Silk Road. Um, so like last year, I, it was like three days before the test, and I was freaking out because I thought, I don't know anything. Um, 
And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to look at past essay questions. And I saw, you know, time and time again, they always have the Silk Roads on their questions. Um, so I studied that a ton and it actually turned out to be my LEQ. Um, so that was pretty helpful. And I'm just going to point something out before we really dive into a ton of uh, in-depth details. And that is that I'm going to rotate between the term like Silk Road and Silk Roads, um, you know, with the plural S, because the Silk Roads are strange because it's really, it's a mixture of roads. It's not really one set path. It's, it's one road here and one road here. And it just sort of builds to become this major idea of trade going from side to side of the, of the world, really. Um, okay, so we have some practice for sourcing. Um, and sourcing is really helpful because it helps you to understand documents more. Um, and you can like, it, it'll benefit you on the DBQ and really just with even some of your multiple choice questions. Um, so just read through this, I'll give you like 20 seconds and try and answer some of the comments. I answer some of the questions. Um, leave it in the comments, that's gonna be very helpful just to you know understand so we can, so we can know what you already know. Okay, I'll give you like 10 more seconds to answer some of the questions um, and then we can talk about them. I mean, if you don't know, you can just write, you know, I don't know in the comments and, you know, we can help you out from there. Okay, um, well, the first part's, uh, the first part of the question is pretty easy because it tells you right in the, in the slideshow who wrote it. So we can see that it's an anonymous assistant to a Chinese merchant. Um, and who is his intended audience? Now, this one is up to a lot of speculation because you really don't know what, you know, what, who did he want to, to read this? Um, but you can sort of assume based off of context that he's probably writing to, it could be a family, it could be some sort of other merchants, uh, other investors. Maybe he's trying to, you know, just tell the story of the Silk Road. Um, so that one, it's it's really up to your interpretation. Um, and then the last one, why was this written? That could be. It seems like he's trying to describe the 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 beauty of the Silk Road, the you know what it encompasses. So we are going to move on and talk about the movement of goods along the Silk Roads. Okay, so you know you have the you have the East and the West. This you know, clear divide. Um, so what you have being transported from the Mediterranean, you have all of these different textiles. Um, you have like beautiful rugs, you have clothes. And when you think of Mediterranean, you always think like, oh, wine or oh, olives. Well, those were two very, uh, very popular things to trade along the trail. Um, so those, you see those mostly going from the Mediterranean, uh, making stops along and ultimately ending up in East Asia. And then in East Asia, you have you know, the namesake of the trade route, the Silk Road, you have silk being transported. Um, you also see items like salt, you see items like spices going transporting, you know, over to the Mediterranean because there weren't, the climates in the Mediterranean weren't great for growing things like spices. Um, and then you have like these luxury items that are really finding their way over. So like China, they have this beautiful porcelain that was, you know, it was considered really pure. It was beautiful. They had these intricate designs really on them. Um, so you see that is getting transported and you find these little scraps of porcelain end up in the Mediterranean. You're like, well, how did that get there? And it's none other than the Silk Road. Okay, um, so we're going to start off with the early Silk Road. And this is important to know because this is a great example of continuity throughout history. Um, so we can see that it's the, the Silk Road really began with nomads. Um, the nomads, they were gen later known as the Mongols, but they generally lived in the Central Asian area. Um, and the problem with Mongols was that they, because they lived this, this nomadic lifestyle, they didn't really, they didn't, they weren't really able to gather a lot of food agriculturally. Um, so by trading these, uh, the products that they came across, by trading their horses, they were able to get food in exchange. Um, so that, that sort of began this exchange. And then over time, you see, 
you know, it's growing. It's not just nomads and people in the East. You start seeing people from India trading. You start seeing people from the Mediterranean, from the Middle East. And it just grows to be this huge phenomenon. Um, and you have the first instances really of real life trade. So what is real life trade? Um, I know it's on there, but does anyone already know? You can leave your answer in the comments. That's fine. Okay. Um, so basically the Silk Road, it becomes so complex over time that one person can't really navigate it on their own. So you see, you see these like mini stops in between. So you might have one merchant go from here to here and then from there they'll trade it off. So another merchant will go from here to here and so on and so on until it eventually gets to its ultimate destination. Um, so in that way, it's almost like a relay race. You know, you merchant goes from one stop to another, another one takes us takes us to another stop and so on and so on until eventually, you know, you have porcelain ending up in the Mediterranean and you have rugs ending up in China. Oh yeah, and I have a map here on the, the pink is the Roman Empire and the yellow is the Han Empire. Um, we'll go more into detail on that. Okay, um, so I just made a quick compare and contrast slide about the Roman and Han. And this is really the first golden age of the Silk Road because these two societies, they have such a, they have such a, they put such importance on merchantry that the Silk Road is able to flourish in this time period. That's why it's a golden age. Um, so Han, China, and Rome were really similar in a lot of ways. Um, like they, they were both these immense empires that had so many people living there. You know, you have upwards of 58 million people. That's, you know, larger than most countries today. And a lot of them had these uh, distinct family values. Uh, not, and, you know, they're pat patrilineal societies, but they're also really like, uh, you know, honor your father, be loyal to your family name. Um, and you see that also to loyalty, also to the state. Um, both have extreme military strength. That's how they were able to conquer such large territories. Um, and then you have their large cities. And almost always a feature in these large cities, you had massive marketplaces. And these prominent marketplaces were what it was able to really, uh, it was an impetus for this Silk Road trade. So then we can talk about contact on the Silk Road between the two. It was never really, it was never really direct. You never had like guys from China over here and guys from Rome over here and they're just shaking hands and giving each other food. That's not how it works, you know? You may have, oh, someone's here, and oh, they'll, you know, they'll pass it on, and they'll pass it on until eventually it'll end up in different places. So, you know, it was very indirect their contacts. Um, you know, but nonetheless, even though they were, they were relatively isolated from each other, they still, they still exchanged currencies. You found, you know, you found Chinese money in Rome. You found Roman money in China, um, and they also had the luxury trade. Um, so. You may have like the porcelain. I've mentioned this a lot, but porcelain is super important because it's viewed as such an important part of uh, it was such an important luxury in Rome. So and this brings like the big question. Why was there a golden age in this time period for the Silk Road? Um, sorry, I just had a slight technical difficulty on my screen. Anywho, okay. Um, basically, the, the two groups heavily valued trade. They had they had a market for these luxury goods, and that caused them to um, really exchange it. Oh, and we have a comment from Eric Beckman, and he said that naming trade routes is a way to use evidence when writing about trade networks like the Silk Road. And that is just a really good point, really good advice for AP World. Um, it can help you out on an SAQ. It could help you out, you know, LEQ, even DBQ for background evidence. So thank you for that. <laughs> okay, and then we're just gonna talk about the first fall of the Silk Road. Um, and you know, your history classes may have glossed over this because they changed the time periods for AP World, but really the fall of Rome was caused by all these different invasions. You had economic issues, there were rebellions, um, and just the government became so corrupt that you know society wasn't able to function. So in that way, Rome, when Rome fell, there was really just this power vacuum in the area. And because there was no central power that took over, there was nobody really instigating these, these merchant trips. So the, silk, the safety of the Silk Road just you know, disappeared. And there wasn't as much demand for Roman goods and foreign empires. And that is why I have this very nice meme on the side. 
um, because once the once the Rome collapsed, uh, you saw the rise of bandits all over the Silk Road, um, and they were easily able to raid people and take their money, so they were in danger. <laughs> and now we're going to talk about um, you know the second golden age of the Silk Road, and in a lot of respects, people consider this to be like the main golden age because this was this was the heyday. Because um, usually a lot of times in the Silk Road, you saw like one empire on one side and one empire on the other, and maybe some like secondary or tertiary, secondary ones in the middle. Um, but with but with the you know Golden Age Part Two, you had three huge empires that all had their own intermediary stops for the Silk Road. Um, so by the 700s, you find that the oh no, what did I do? Okay. Um, oh no, no, sorry about that. Okay, uh, anyway, so by the 700s, you really find that the order has been restored and that it, you know, everything's safer now. So because of this, the safety is restored and there's a demand for, there's a demand for these foreign markets, you find that there's there's more you know the Silk Road is really reinvigorated. Um, so the Abbasids. Does anyone know who the Abbasids were, or maybe like what region they were in? Leave that in the comments. Okay. Um, well, the Abbasids were one of the many Islamic caliphates, and basically they had Sharia law, and that's Islam. That's basically Islamic law, um, and. So Sharia, it has this uh, a lot of value on merchantry, and it protects merchants from from uh, like you know damages for suing all that fun stuff. Um, so that in putting such high value and uh, having such a value on trade, the Abbasids were really able to uh, instigate the revival of the Silk Road. Um, you also have the Byzantines. So the Byzantines are really just like the Eastern Roman Eastern Roman Empire. Um, just under a different name. <laughs> um, and they had this huge city, Constantinople slash Byzantium, and later should be known as Istanbul. That was really just this really, it was in a great location because you could easily transport goods from the Mediterranean onto land and from land onto the Mediterranean. Um, so that led to the Byzantines gaining a ton of power. And ultimately when the trade route shifted, Byzantine, the Byzantines and Constantinople fell because of this lack of trade. Um, and eventually you see something pretty cool happen with the Byzantines, and that's that they create their own silk production trade. They decided if silk from China is going to be so expensive, we'll just make it ourselves. Um, and then last on this page, you have the Tang. And the Tang were one of the many Chinese dynasties, like a later version of the Han, basically. And they had a very, very stable government. And that's what really was able to that their stable government is what caused them to have such high yields in trade. Um, so there's a pretty famous city in China called uh, Xi'an, and this was earlier known as Chang'an, um, and it was like a foreign destination. I just butchered those pronunciations. I am so sorry. Um, but really, it the city the city grew because of trade, and it still remains, and it became home to a lot of diaspora communities. Um, so then we have the Mongols, and that's Golden Age Part 3. Um, so if you've seen any Crash Course videos, you know that the Mongols, they really, they were the, they were the quick empire, you know? They were into an area, they were out of an area, they conquered the area. Um, so they're very, they're very efficient in that way. And if you look on the side, I have, uh, some images I'd like to explain. The bottom one, you can see that it's actually a map of the Mongols conquered territory. And that's almost all of, you know, you have East Asia, you have Central Asia, you have West Asia, you have parts of Russia in there, you have parts of India, you know, it's just a huge empire that they had. And then I also have the Mongols in the 1200, literally nowhere. Um, so yeah, it was all really because of Genghis Khan. He united all these different nomadic tribes and he, he caused them to begin their, their raids of uh, different nations. So basically, in invading parts of Asia and East Europe, they were able to create this new peace. They were able to restore peace. So after the, here, let me go back. After all these major groups fell, 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. After all these major groups fell, um, and there was a relative loss of safety, the Mongols were able to restore that safety um, and instigate trade. You also have the Yasa, and that's basically Mongolian law code, and they have these very strict rules on trade. So if you if you like infringe on a trade agreement, then you could be punished horribly. So the Mongols really, uh, they created this trade by having their horses. They could easily ride from you know one country to another, to the next, to the next. And that allowed for them to reinvigorate Silk Road trade. But eventually the fall of the Mongols led to the fall of the Silk Road. So when you had no major administrative power over the area, the people were able to rise up. And you know, with re rebellion comes loss of safety, and with loss of safety becomes, you know, you can't trade. Um, so because the Mongols fell, the Silk Road never really was able to restore its power. Um, now there's a huge pattern that's helpful to understand about the Silk Road. And it's that the Silk Road rises and falls with empires. In every, you know, in all those intermediary times between empires, you see that trade is just decreasing. You know, when you have the Roman Han, it's, it spikes up. When you when they fall, it spikes down. When you have the Tang and the Abbasids, you know, it shoots up and then it goes down until you finally have the Mongols who, who give it its last heyday. And then it's no longer a lucrative business. Um, so that's just something that's really important to understand about the Silk Road. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some major figures in the Silk Road history. Um, and we're going to start off with Marco Polo. And, you know, you know him from the classic game, you know, Marco Polo. Um, but he did a lot, lot more than that. <laughs> um, he was an Italian explorer and merchant. And he traveled along the Silk Road for a few, de few decades, I think. Um, and along that time, he was, it was about 25,000 miles. He recorded all of his journeys in a book and took it back to Europe. So in that way, he, he was able to expose the Europeans to a lot of the Silk Road trade. Because um, if you'll recall, in the 1200s, the Europe, you know, Europe was in their dark ages. Um, so there wasn't as much, there wasn't as much outside access. And in a way, Marco's, Marco Polo's works were able to provide this outside influence. Um, then you have Xuanzang, and he was a bit different from the other examples on this page because he didn't travel throughout the whole Silk Road. He, he really just did like a pilgrimage to India. Um, and he was a Buddhist monk, so in going to India, he was able to experience life of other of other Buddhist monks, and you know, make a collection of their works, um, and help really to expose other Chinese people to this. Um, so it was a few thousand miles that he traveled. I couldn't find a you know specific number, um, but not as much as the other people, but still had an amazing cultural influence on China and really. Uh, reaffirming the position of Buddhism in the nation. Um, and then you have Ibn Battuta, and he was a Moroccan scholar, um, and he, he was an Islamic scholar and traveler, and he went over 73,000 miles. So just thinking about that kind of hurts my brain. Um, that's almost three times as much as Marco Polo. And he wrote, he kept all of his, uh, all of his journals in this book known as Rila, uh, known as Journey in English, and he just had so many different experiences. Um, a lot of his a lot of his journal entries you can actually find on different DBQs from the past. So just being familiar with some of his uh, you know some of his major travels can be helpful, um, especially for like essays. Okay, so now we can talk about some major cities on the Silk Road, um, and these cities really emerged because they were they were reasonable places to stop on a caravan. Um, so if you think about you know you have a camel right, a camel can only go so so many miles without water without food. So usually these cities are about a hundred miles apart, and you can find yeah a hundred miles apart you'll just find all these random cities in the middle of nowhere. Um, a lot of times they're built on around an oasis, so uh, you know just like a little body of water in the middle of a desert, and and around these oases, you see, you know, cities pop up. You see caravanserai pop up. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is Kashgar. And that, is, that was settled by the Uyghurs. And it's in the Uyghur region of China. Um, and if you, you've been reading a lot about, you know, maybe news lately, uh, you know there's actually a huge 
huge current events problem going on with the Uyghurs right now um, because there's there's like a Chinese movement to to you know get rid of the Uyghurs um, because they are they practice Islam uh, and guess what the you know practicing Islam is a product of it's a product of the Silk Road. So anyway, Kashgar is located in Western China. Um, and over time, it just became this hub of transport between the East and the West. Um, so a large city sort of sprouted up there. Um, you also have Samarkand. So I'm just going to, I did not say that right. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm going to pull up a map for you guys. Where did it go? Okay, um, so here we have a map. Okay, um, and if you look at this map, you can see that right around, well, okay, we have uh, Kashgar right around there, and Samarkand is right there. So if you look at this, like, uh, gauge up here, you can see they're somewhere around maybe 400 miles apart. Um, so that was like the distance between two major cities. But basically, let me go back to my slideshow. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so going back to the slideshow, uh, it really sprouted up in northeast Uzbekistan and basically the middle of a desert. And they really became known for their fine crafts. Like they were, they had these, uh, you know, these beautiful trade works. And because of all of the, the crafts people, you had these different craft fairs and marketplaces just really popping up everywhere. Um, so in the 1200s, when the Mongols began their raids, you, it was actually completely destroyed by them. Um, and it wasn't for another like 200 years and the rise of Tamerlane and his, and his empire that Samarkand was really restored. Um, and then our next location is Constantinople. Um, you probably are familiar with Constantinople from the you know classic song, "Take Me Back to Constantinople." Okay, I'm not gonna sing. Uh, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I touched on this briefly before, but Constantinople is this really great location because you can easily jump from Mediterranean trade to um, to like trade on land. Because if you look at the map that I put on the bottom. Um, there's there's this there's the strait right there and you have this huge expanse of uh, expanse of water so it's at a very convenient location for trade and eventually when the trade routes started to shift um it was because of this lack of trade that constantinople fell so that sort of weakened the city and made it more susceptible to islamic takeover in 14 in the 1400s um and the last like urban center i'm going to talk about is chang'an and i you know, mentioned this briefly also. Um, it's known as Xi'an today. And it was actually the capital of a ton of different dynasties of China. Um, but I'm just talking about the Tang capital because that one is most pertinent to the Silk Roads. Um, so it was this huge cultural center of learning and it had all of these different markets. So I was actually able to find a picture, well, a drawing of one of the markets. Um, and you can see that there's just all these different, there's a ton of livestock, there's a ton of people. And you have these really uh, large buildings too. You have fires to guard people. Um, so I just found that was a very neat picture. So we're gonna do some SAQ practice. I think this may have been a part of the SAQ a few years ago. But for those of you who don't know, the SAQ is basically the short answer question. So, sorry. <laughs> Usually answer in like three to four sentences. Um, and it's a simple answer. Um, so we're going to, you don't have to answer the whole thing. Um, but in the comments, it would be really helpful for, you know, but for you and me, if you could just sort of give me like a three word answer that could answer part A. So I'm going to give you like 20 seconds to come up with something for that.
okay, like 15 more seconds to try and just read through it and think it over. And if you haven't uh, learned about Indian Ocean trade yet, then I would advise that you check out um, one of the streams that we have on it. Uh, I believe it's a replay, so you'll need the plus program to watch it, but it was really helpful. Okay, anyway, that's fine. So we, there's a ton of different things we come up with. Um, on the slideshow, I mentioned that both form diaspora communities. So a, dias a diaspora community is basically when a group of people migrates, has a mass migration to another area. Um, so we actually have an upcoming stream on that. I think it's in like two days. Um, check it out on the Fiveable website, but it'll be super helpful, especially for essay questions like this SIQ. Um, another thing that we come up with is cultural syncretism. And cultural syncretism is basically like a fusion of two cultures. So a great example of syncretism with like the Indian Ocean trade is Swahili, the language. Um, so that's like a combination of Arabic and a lot of uh, native Bantu languages of, of Africa. Um, also, both were similar in how they led to the growth of a rich merchant class. So in both scenarios, um, the merchants really you know, had such high benefits from all this that they were able to grow wealthy. Okay, um, now for part B, uh, try and answer it in a few words in the comment section. Um, just so that we can, you know, we can really see what you need help with. Um, we can help cater future videos toward your needs. I'll give you like 20 seconds to answer this one. Okay, um, so there's a ton of different examples for this. Um, but one thing that we can say is the caravan Caesarai. Once again, I said that completely wrong. Um, and basically that's like our, you know, our, our holiday inn. Um, because around the caravan, the caravan Sarai, you see these huge, these huge, huge, huge markets just popping up everywhere. Um, so in having these large markets, you have increased uh, cash flow and commercial revenue. Um, another cause for commercial growth is the Islamic and Mongol takeover. So like the Islam, the, sorry, the Islamic caliphates, they were, they, you know, with their heavy emphasis on, emphasis on trade, they were able to spread their, they were able to gain more money. And the same thing really applies to the Mongols. Um, you have like different economic systems that arose to so, like forms of credit. Um, you have paper money and you have banking houses. So basically this streamlined the cash flow process, you know, by having, you know, flying money, which is basically, you know, you drop off your money here, you pick it up there. Um, it, it streamlined the process and people had to carry less money with them. So they were able to pick it up somewhere else and they were able to just spend all their cash. Um, and the important thing to remember for this question is that you don't need to know 8 million examples for it. You could just have one really strong example and still get the full credit for the question. Um, and then part C says, identify and explain one effect of the increased volume of trade on the Silk Roads in the time period before 1450 CE. I'll give you like 20 seconds. Oh, no. I'll give you like 20 seconds to answer it in the comments. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing we could say is the spread of disease, because if we think about it, you know, you, you always carry these unwanted, unwanted guests with you wherever you go. Um, and it's a great example of this is like the Black Death in Europe. Um, it also spread religion. So uh, if we think back to our people, you have Xuanzang, and he helped to spread Buddhism by going on the Silk Road. Um, so by having like these increased trade routes, these increased flow on trade routes, you were able to spread religion. Um, and the same, you also have cultural diffusion. So if there's more people on this on this Silk Road, you can you can access and understand other people's cultures. Okay, and then we're just gonna, this is like our last real body slide. Um, and this is just about technology on the Silk Road. Um, so 
last year's uh, last year's LAQ, I actually talked about this. Um, basically, it was something like uh, analyzed technology used on the Silk Roads versus Indian Ocean trade routes, um, and a lot of they have a lot of overlap in the supplies they used. So on the Silk Roads, you see the emergence of the compass, and that was originally created in China. So basically, they were able to navigate all these different land, all these huge expanses of land more easily. You also have the caravanserai, and that was your, um, you know, your holiday inn where you can stay, you can visit a marketplace, and then you have the camel saddle. And basically, this was helpful because you could ride on a camel instead of walking beside it. How nice! How innovative! Um, but you also have you know, the flow of objects on the Silk Roads. So uh, when you think, a lot of people, when they think of colonial Europe, they think of gunpowder and guns and how, you know, how that gave them an advantage over a lot of native cultures in the Americas. And if not for Silk Roads, this gunpowder likely wouldn't have reached them for that. Um, so that's something that's super important that was transported on the Silk Roads. And you also have printing techniques. Um, so in China during the Song Dynasty, you saw like a woodblock printing emerge. So this was able to spread along the Silk Road, uh, get to Europe, get to Africa, get to you know Northern Asia. Very helpful stuff right there. Okay, um, so we're gonna end with a Q and A period. So if you have a question from class, if you need help with studying, um, if you want to review a topic, if you know maybe you want you have a question about something in the stream, um, leave your answers in the comments. I'll leave your questions in the comments. And, you know, feel free to ask a question because if you ask questions, you can understand things more. I'll give you like 30 seconds to think of something else, it's something if you need it. Okay, um, so if you guys don't have any questions, then we can probably finish up the stream. I'm um, just going to end by saying, you know, follow Think Fivable on all of their accounts. They've got Twitter, they've got Instagram, they have YouTube. Um, you know, the YouTube channel is how I found them, and it was so helpful for me, especially independent studying. Um, their Twitter's good. They have some very nice Instagram content. Um, and then check me out on Instagram and Twitter. Um, if you guys have questions after the stream or, you know, just want to help with review something, anytime really I am available. So you can just DM me on either of those platforms um, and I can help you out. So I hope you learned some stuff. I, uh, you know, I hope you uh, now understand some topics. Uh, I hope you have a good time. So thanks a lot for attending. Uh, yeah. Have a nice weekend, guys. <laughs>